Hi, I'm John the Engineer Termel, and given my leader Stephen Harper has joined Barack Obama, Sarkozy, and Cameron in attempting to kill Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, I read his book. You can find it at johntermel.com slash gaddafi.wmv. This is the fifth part from the excerpts of his book on how to have a social world. And I hope our thugs don't kill him. Part 3, The Social Basis for the Third Universal Theory. Heroes in history are individuals who've made sacrifices for the sake of one cause or another. But what were those causes? They sacrificed themselves for the sake of others. Contemporary national liberation movements are also social movements and shall not cease to occur until every group is liberated from the domination of another. A sound rule is that every nation should have a religion or two. Any contrary condition is an exception to this rule. Marriage may have a positive or negative effect on the social factor. It is true that men and women are naturally free to accept or reject the proposed partner in marriage for whatever reason. Nevertheless, taking partners from the same community naturally reinforces the cohesion of the community and promotes collective development in conformity with the social factor. The family. To an individual, the family is more important than the state. Humanity recognizes the individual as a human being, and the normal individual not acknowledges the family, which is his cradle, his origin, and which serves as his social umbrella. Therefore, any measure, condition, or circumstance which throws a family into disorder or leads to its dispersion and ruin is inhuman and goes against nature. A thriving society is one in which the family flourishes and the individual grows normally within its bosom and is established as a member of the human community. The tribe. The tribe is an extended family that's grown as a result of procreation. The social bond, cohesion, unity, familiarity, and affection are all stronger at the familial level than at the tribal level. They are also stronger at the tribal level than the national level and are least strong at the universal level. This is why it's very important for the human community to preserve the cohesion of the family, the tribe, the nation, and the world in order to profit from the advantages, benefits, values, and ideals yielded by the solidarity, cohesion, unity, familiarity, and love of the family, tribe, nation, and humanity. The advantages of the trial. The code of ethics enforced by the tribe on its members is a kind of social education better and nobler than any school education. The tribe is actually a social school which people belong to from childhood and are raised with ideals that take root and instinctively influence their behavior in life as they grow older. The nation. A nation is a large extended family that passed through the tribal state. The tribe, then a plurality of tribes that have branched out from one common source. But why has the world map witnessed the emergence and disappearance of great powers and the emergence and disappearance of other states? But why should changes occur in this world map from one era to another? When a political structure comprises more than one nation, then the map of the state is ripped apart as each nation obtains its separate national independence. Thus, political empires were ripped apart and the nations reverted to their original social structures. But why are empires formed of several nations? It has to do with loan sharking. A common religion may create a state that embraces several nations. Economic imperatives and military conquests may do the same. Thus, the world can witness the existence of a state or empire in one particular historical period but then witnesses its fall and disappearance in another. When the spit, and that's because the loan sharks took the funding away from that king, gave it to that king so he could afford to go conquer him. Who had the gold determined who was the king? All states made up of diverse nationalities for religious, economic, military, or ideological reasons shall eventually be ripped apart by national conflict until every nationality gains its independence. Women. Women, like men, are human beings. This is an incontestable truth. Therefore, as humans, it's a fact that women are equal to men. And to discriminate between them is a glaring, inexcusable injustice. For there is a natural difference between man and woman. This in turn signifies an assigned role for which that differs in accordance with the difference between the two sexes. 
Each is to have his or her prevailing conditions in order that they might live and perform their assigned roles. Each sex has its own particular life role or function, and these are different and irreplaceable. Neither can ever assume the function of the other. To separate children from their mothers and cram them in nurseries is to treat them just like chicks in a chicken coop. And it is only natural motherhood that is appropriate and right for the children of mankind. Children are to grow up in a family where motherhood, fatherhood, and comradeship of brothers and sisters prevail, and not in an institution resembling a poultry farm. As for children who are orphans and homeless, society is their guardian. Only for them should society establish nurseries, orphanages, and the like to accommodate them. They are better off as charges of society than as charges of individuals who are not their natural parents. Well, I don't know if foster parents taking care of orphans is such a bad idea. Natural growth for all living things is free, healthy growth. To substitute a nursery for a mother is a coercion that runs counter to the freedom of proper growth. The only justification for such an unnatural and inhuman process is the fact that the woman is in a position unsuitable to her natural role. She is required to perform duties other than social obligations which are in conflict with the duties of motherhood. Motherhood is the female's function, not the male's. Consequently, it is in the natural order that children should not be separated from their mothers, and any measure taken to do so is tyrannical, oppressive, and dictatorial. It is also equally unjust and cruel to have women study a discipline that would lead them to jobs incompatible with their nature. However, there is no difference whatsoever between women and, women and men as human beings, for the woman is the rightful owner of the house. Because a home is necessary to women who become pregnant, who give birth, experience confinement, and perform the duties of motherhood. It would be thus be unjust to deprive children of their mother and to deprive mothers of their homes. Therefore, a world revolution is needed to do away with all the materialistic conditions that prevent women from performing their natural role in life, and so drives them to carry out men's duties in order to achieve equal rights. Such a revolution is inevitable, especially in industrial societies. It is a reaction to the instinct of survival. Driving a woman to do man's work is an unfair aggression against the femininity that is naturally bestowed upon her for a natural purpose essential to life. This is not a question of whether women should or should not work. It is ridiculous to pose the problem as such. Work and opportunities should be made available by society to all capable and needy individuals, women and men, provided that each individual works in an appropriate domain and is not coerced by oppressive circumstances to go into inappropriate domains. To have children working in adult domains is dictatorial and an outrage, and to have women working in the domain of masculine work is similarly dictatorial and outrage. Work that befits a man is not always work appropriate for a woman, and knowledge that is suitable for adults is not the knowledge suitable for children. There is no difference in human rights between men and women or between adults and children. Yet, there is no full equality in terms of their duties. Minorities. What is a minority? What are the rights and responsibilities of a minority? How can the problem of minorities be resolved? Minorities are of two kinds only. A minority belonging to a nation, and its nation provides it with its social framework, and a minority that has no nation and thus forms its own social framework. This minority has its own social rights, as we have seen, and it would be unjust of any party or majority to infringe upon these rights. To look upon a minority as a political and economic minority is dictatorial and unjust. Black people. The last period in history that has shown slavery was that which witnessed the white man enslaving the black race. The black people's psychological search for a satisfactory way to deal with this past and to gain self-respect is a psychological incentive that cannot be disregarded in the movement of the black race to avenge itself and triumph. Learning. Learning and teaching must not merely involve regular syllabuses and specific materials that young people are constrained to learn during specified hours using printed books and copy books. Mandatory education, which countries of the world are proud to enforce on their youth, is a coercive education that suppresses freedom. Well, I don't mind an enforced curriculum in math and science. It deprives human beings of free choice and hinders brilliance and creativity. 
Well, what kind of creativity can you have when you're studying arithmetic? A worldwide cultural revolution must destroy all the prevalent educational systems in the world to liberate the human mentality from syllabuses that nurture fanaticism and the del deliberate reshaping of man's concepts, his tastes, and his mentality, except for the syllabuses of math and science. This is not, as it may seem to superficial readers, a call to close down educational institutions, nor is it an invitation to people to shun education. On the contrary, it's a call for society to provide all kinds of education and give the people the freedom of selecting the discipline of their choice. Well, yeah. Sports, horsemanship, and the stage. Sports, like power, should be for the masses. And just as wealth and weapons should be for the people, sports as a social activity should also be for the people. Well, I'm sorry. I agree wealth, we all deserve our share. And I agree uh, weapons, I suppose, we all deserve our share. But sports? Oh, come on. No, no. Sports is, not, is nice, and you want to be able to participate. But the fact that other people excel and we pay to watch just doesn't mean that I'm not getting my right and I'm deprived in any way. The multitude which crowds the stadium to watch a game, laugh and applaud, is a multitude of fools who are incapable of practicing sports themselves. Yeah, a lot of cripples like to watch football, basketball, and baseball. They can't participate themselves, but they're not fools for enjoying the excellence of the pros. They crowd the grandstands practicing lethargy and applaud those heroes who took the initiative and who dominated the field and the sporting activities and exploited all the offered means of support sustained by the masses. Yes, and I don't think there's one cripple at a football game who feels bad about that. The grandstands of public athletic fields are actually constructed to obstruct access to the fields. These grandstands shall one day be vacated and abolished when the masses march into the athletic fields to practice sports in crowds as they realize that sports are activities to be practiced, not watched. And boy, do I disagree. The grandstands still shall disappear when no spectators come to fill the rows in the seats. Yeah, people aren't going to watch those who excel in their sport excel at it. Likewise, horsemen who ride their horses have no place on the sidelines of the racetrack. And if all people owned horses, there would be no spectators to watch and applaud. Well, I don't think so. If everybody owned a horse, you'd still show up to see who had the fastest horse. The seated spectators are only those who cannot practice horse riding because they do not ride horses. I don't think so. I know lots of guys who go to the races not to really watch the horses because they can't ride because they want to bet on them. Thus, Bedouin people are not interested in the theater and other performances because they are hardworking and take life very seriously. And what excuse for not having no entertainment. I work too hard. We're coming into a world of abundance, and when you don't have to work so hard anymore, what are you going to do with your spare time? They are the makers of the serious life, and that is why they look upon acting with scorn. Whoa, talk about strict. Bedouin people also don't watch players playing a game. They practice their own games collectively and hold their own festivities because they feel the spontaneous, inexplicable need for it. Yeah, a guy in wheelchair wants to play baseball. The various kinds of boxing and wrestling are evidence that mankind has not yet purged the tendency to cruel behavior. Well, boxing, yeah, you're trying to hurt the other guy, damage his brain. But wrestling, you're just trying to pin him. Big difference. But this shall inevitably come to an end when man progresses and becomes more civilized. So, Muammar Gaddafi's book, The Green Book. Lots I don't agree with. Minor stuff about being too egalitarian and wanting to share too much. And much stuff I believe in. And at no point does this sound like a dictator to me. So, Muammar al-Gaddafi, hail, you have my respect. And I hope that the thugs... Obama, Cameron, Sarkozy, Harper don't manage to kill you, even if they just manage to kill your family.